Jacqueline Meeks from the <laughs> University of Auckland. I'm director at the Centre for Biodiversity and Biosecurity. Um, and I've also recently just taken on the role of theme leader for the science faculty around sustainability. So we're now as a university starting to focus a little bit more on joining up all the dots um, in the sustainability area. So, um, so what I thought I'd do um, today, and it's, it's informal, so please interrupt it at any stage, um, but I just thought I'd give a more global context on how this might fit, and, and nationally and locally, um, and because I think somebody said it before, I think it's right we do need to act locally, but I think we also need to be thinking of, of that bigger context and how what you're doing here contributes um, globally as well. Um, and so I think this is a, was a really um, internationally a landmark day in 2017 where finally the UN Human Rights Council acknowledged that biodiversity and particularly the degradation and loss of biodiversity was a really important part of human rights. And that's not been the case before. And so finally we have um, at a high level inter internationally acknowledgement of how important um, biodiversity is to human well-being, and there's all been all sorts of things before that, of course. But to see that formally acknowledged, I think, has been a milestone. Similarly, um, back at the turn of the millennium, um, this international uh, initiative, which was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, um, came into being. Where we kind of had a go globally at looking at where are we. Um, internationally in terms of um, ecosystems um, and it, you know again it highlights the link between biodiversity and the foundation of ecosystems as being really um, intimately linked to the human well-being so for me um, I mean I've been playing the ecology game forever it seems um, right through my career and and it's been a real morphing for ecologists, I think, to be just focusing on the environment, to now thinking, actually, it's, it's the well-being of people and the environment, and they're intertwined, and we can't have one without, without the other. And so I think that's been a really important focus, because it's also brought to the fore the fact that we have to work with communities. You know, we can't have professionals off in one area just doing it all, unless we're all in this together and all working away at it. Um, we're actually not going to make the progress on a wide enough scale or quickly enough to do what needs to happen. If, um... So for me as an ecologist, it's great to see us thinking a lot more holistically about what we're doing as a society. So the next bit of international piece in the puzzle is thinking about you know, what are those key drivers in biodiversity loss. And this was a paper in 2016, so relatively recent, and they simply looked at all the IUCN red listed species, so those species when we know enough to classify them as threatened or near threatened, and there's about 9,000 of them, and say what were the main drivers leading to their decline. And it won't be any surprise <laughs> to you what they are, they're all the common things. But it's kind of nice to see them, so the size of the circle represents, you know, how many species are being affected by that driver. So over-exploitation is overwhelmingly um, the main one, followed closely by um, agricultural activity. Urban development is definitely increasing as we spread and spread our cities, um, both in extent and intensity. Um, invasions and disease are important and stuff goes on pollution um, system modification and climate change obviously rapidly escalating and the um, impact that's having on biodiversity. So it's a snapshot in time, it's not static, some things are going up faster than others and it's very context dependent. So in some places, particularly um, islands such as New Zealand for instance, things like invasion and disease we know have far bigger impact um, than perhaps some of the other drivers, so it's, it's all context dependent, but overall that's, those are the things um, we need to globally be thinking about. And in New Zealand we know that invasive mammalian predators are one of our key drivers, but again internationally, um, so this is 58% of birds, mammals and reptiles globally um, have 
have been uh, important in driving recent extinction. So a lot of the focus in New Zealand now is focusing on those invasive main, the main predators. They are really important. I would argue that we need to be. We don't. We want to make sure we don't lose um, sight of, of other things that are, are playing out in our systems as well. So, if I asked you, we're going to play leasing games now because it's a hot afternoon. We'll all go to sleep. Otherwise, <laughs> how many native New Zealand species are currently estimated to be at risk of extinction? Are we talking 50, 100, 350, 900? Mm. 900? Sorry? 900? 900? I'm a pessimist, I'm 900. Yeah. 900. <laughs> pessimistic pessimistic pessimist. 350. Around 350? 100. 350. 350 over in this corner, changing your bets. 100. 100. Has anyone chosen 50? No one's chosen 50. I'll no. choose 50. No, <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Yeah. It's more than 900. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And another 2,800 declining or at risk. So I think this is a point that um, many New Zealanders kind of overlook. We know a lot of our birds and things have gone extinct, a lot of them are in trouble. We are just nowhere near out of the woods. We have an insanely large number of species that are on a downward trajectory and if we do nothing we will lose. Um, and worryingly, I mean, the Department of Conservation doesn't particularly like these figures, you know, only 250 of the 900 or 2,800 pit per metric are currently in conservation programs. We can't even, you know, ma we're not even managing half of the things at risk. There's a whole number of species, such as the Chesterfield skink, on the brink of dis extinction, virtually nothing happening until a private organisation, and I've highlighted here the Endangered Species Foundation because I was working with them for a wee while, but they have decided that they will pick up some of these lesser known endangered species and go looking for, for funding and what actions need to be taken to reverse some of these things. But, you know, it comes back to my point at the beginning, which is we can't wait around for government or local council or whatever to, to deal with these things. The problem's too big, it's too widespread and it's happening too quick. So I'm really enthusiastic about groups like this. You guys are what will help make the difference for New Zealand. Right. Locally you will, but on a, in a national and an international sense, what you do actually can really make a difference. So I talked about, you know, well-being and state of the environment and those sorts of things. And so there's all sorts of stuff happening internationally and nationally. And Auckland has been great in picking up some of this stuff too. So the Auckland Council put out, I think, their last state of the environment report was in 2015. And they simply take a snapshot look across the region and they measure as best they can all sorts of things to try and track over time, you know, just where are we at um, in terms of environment. And so they're able to put a green tick on some things. Actually, air quality in Auckland has improved regionally over the last um, wee while. Some areas where we are intensively managing biodiversity, they're making good progress slightly silent on the areas that aren't, but we know, basically if we, we know how to manage a lot of these areas and if we intensively manage it enough, we can reverse some of these trends. Um, if you look at some of our um, freshwater and marine environments, actually we're doing really poorly, um, and we have this um, ever um, uh, problem of, of the expansion of the Auckland footprint. So, and this is just going to keep biting and biting us here. And great areas on the cusp of this to some extent. I mean, we're protected to some extent by distance. But, you know, all those people in, in Auckland, the proportions come to start drifting this way and the development that happens in, in that often. If it's not kind of done carefully and thoughtfully around environmental issues, it can lead to um, degrading the environment. So, the summary that they put in there was that to accommodate the estimated 700,000 extra people that's going to be in the Auckland region in the next 30 years, we actually need to have a really smart development strategy that starts thinking a lot more carefully about um, the environment. 
Okay, and so Auckland Council, actually, I think they're doing some very cool things. Um, waterways um, and other marine systems are identified in area as areas in New Zealand where they're doing, in Auckland, particularly where they're doing poorly, and so they have initiatives so it's like the Waterway Protection Fund where they're getting in there, and they're working with landowners, identifying areas where they can fence off and manage the waterways and wetlands, and... Um, Stop the livestock getting in the, into their replant where they're um, possible, and, and so some of that stuff um, is really quite exciting, and it's it's good to see that happening. So where do you fit in, in all of this? <laughs> so what is surprisingly enough, and for so much of New Zealand, is we just don't know what the biodiversity trends are. You know, we tend to go off and um, measure the novel or exciting things. So I'm on the Kākāpō Recovery Group. I've been on that group for 20-odd years now, and it's, we know every last Kākāpō, and we know exactly what's happening there, and I can tell you chapter and verse all that's happening with Kākāpō. But I couldn't tell you, you know, what are TUI numbers doing nationally? Um, and so it's surprisingly what we don't know, and the only way that we're going to get now at some of those things, and particularly the common species where it's hard to get government funding to use of these things, is if community groups like you pick up the call and say, well, we want to know what's happening to our band of droughtal population along there over the long term. If we know what, what the, the biodiversity trends are, then we can work out, is it declining? And if it is, what are those causes? It's a fair bit in much of the country, it's around the mainland pests, and so that's where folk like you come in and you can do all sorts of neat things. How do you know what you've reduced the pest numbers to? So all that effort that's going in, what are you getting your pest numbers down to? And is that enough? If we're doing that much, are we overdoing it? Are we underdoing it? What would happen if you did it more intensively? What would happen if you did it in a larger area? What happens if you just keep doing as you're doing? Maybe that's cool for, for doing. So unless you're measuring, you don't know where you're, where you're heading. And if you don't know that, then you don't know where you should be focusing and prioritising you. But it's a big task that we have ahead of us, so unless we prioritise, we're not going to get there because we don't have endless resources. So I was just going to quickly um, run through an example because what you do and where you monitor very much depends on well, why are you doing it, what sorts of habitat um, are you trying to protect and what resources do you have to do this. <laughs> and in many community groups it's the people on the ground um, and so there's a lot of different techniques you can use, there's a lot of different um, groups that you can target. Typically we would use indicator species, we would pick communities of birds or a few species of birds or invertebrates. If you're thinking about mammalian predators, then you'd want to look at pest abundance and then you might also measure some more of the environmental metrics such as water quality. So there's all different sorts of things you can do. You can have the gold-plated thing where you do everything or you can pick the bits which you're particularly interested in or you think as a community these are the bits that I'm interested in, or this is what this neck of the woods is, is, is specific um, to our area. So I think focusing down on what's achievable and what's of importance is an important part of these, this process. So it's great to have folk like you and Bob guiding that process um, and making sure that it's um, as coordinated as possible because it's that coordination and the joining up of all the dots together where you get the added value out of what you're doing. So I'm just giving this as an example of what you can do with five minute bird counts. So five minute bird counts is what it says you go out and you stand in a place and you count how many birds you can see or hear in five minutes. And it's a standardised technique that's been used around the country, if not around the world, to index bird numbers. So it's not designed to count every last bird in the area, it's just to give you an index of what might be happening. And if you repeat it systematically over time and space, then you get an idea of what your bird community is like. So this is a project that I was 
involved in Mount Misery and Nelson Lakes National Park right down the South Island there. And there were simply 18 stations that went up an altitudinal transect and um, six counts were done over three different times of the year. Um, and the important thing for why I think this data set proved so valuable, it was done over the long haul. So it was about 30 odd years of, of data, not completely, um, it wasn't done every year, but most years it was done. And so you could build up over time a picture of what your bird community looked like. And so I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs of the data, but I'll just give you a taste of what it looks like. So this is called multivariate um, uh, non-dimensional scaling analysis. You don't need to remember. All you need to know, and students love this because it's so simple, the closer together two points are, the more similar those bird communities are, and the further apart they are, the more different they are. So this is looking at the altitudinal transit. These are lake level down the bottom, and it's saying the bird communities at the bottom of the lake are much more similar to each other than at the top of the mountain. Okay, no surprises there. That's really good. That tells us that our bird index is telling us something sensible. We know that as you go up a mountain, you get different birds coming in and out of the system. You can then take that data and say, okay, what does that look like over time. So here's the altitude going from the lake up the mountain. Back in 1974, the bird community was relatively stable for quite a long time. You know, there was these these dots are all close together essentially, and then things started to change in the um, 80s and then through to here. Massive difference. By the time we get to 2007. The bird community here is vastly different from what it was back in the 70s. Mm. Why? Vespa of wasps came in over that time. Possums came through that area over the time. All sorts of things could have been changing. It doesn't tell you what was driving those changes necessarily. You can have some guesses. But what you do have is really good evidence that that bird community has changed hugely over time. And then you can look in more detail and say, well, what was changing? And you can see the bill bird numbers went down, and then there was a little bit of a recovery um, later on. The TUI numbers were more or less the same, and then they did a dramatic mm -hmm. drop away. Um, the tomtits declined and then sort of stabilised. You can go over time. The grey warblers have just done a long-term decline. The yellow crown parakeets have um, increased over time. Overall, you can look at going, well, all these bird species were decreasing, these were increasing, and brown creeper and blackbird were more or less the same. So it's one of the only studies in the whole of New Zealand where people have looked at the common birds over a long time period and say, what's happening? And sadly, the answer is that for many of our, our species, their numbers have been declining. So Mount Misery and Nelson Lakes National Park has no management at all, and this actually turns out to be quite an important site because lots of New Zealand, or bits of New Zealand, are now managed, so most people go and count where the management is happening, and we don't have anything to compare it with what's happened, what happens if we do nothing. Things, many things start to drop away. 